All right. Uh, so thanks once again for coming to tonight's meetup. Um, so before we get started, a few quick, quick announcements. Um, Big Data Day LA is happening June 27th. I think I've mentioned this several times. Uh, we actually finalized the speakers, and uh, we're reaching out to them just to finally confirm. But we have a great list of speakers. Uh, we're probably going to do a, new, a fifth track because we had so many quality speakers that we decided just to add in a new track rather than you know uh, shortlist them. So uh, we're going to it's uh, probably going to do about 45 to 50 talks. Uh, it's June 27th again, you know, whole day, completely free to the public. We're going to open up registration um, this or next week, and you should probably sign up for it. We just finalized the location also today, so that's another uh, great, another uh, uh, great uh, thing to know about. So with that, uh, with, let me just quickly introduce uh, Byron. He's going to do a few a short talk on Rubicon. They are host for today, so please give a warm welcome to Byron. Hi guys, thanks very much, Shibash, for uh, organizing yet another meeting. Meet up. Um, I'm really, really excited to hear from Nikita about all about Apache Ignite. Uh, it's been generating a lot of buzz lately, so interested to hear what it's all about. For uh, those of you, who thanks for coming. I wanted to point out the, the guest Wi-Fi is available over here. Um, if you need parking validation at the end, I'm going to be standing over near the sign-in sheet. And uh, and of course, uh, we're hiring uh, Java devs mostly, and a few other things as well. So, some C++. So if you're interested, come talk to me about that too. We have a really, really cool company. All right, back to you, Shibash. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Byron. So with that, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, our presenter for today, uh, Nikita Ivanov of Group. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, no problem. Yeah, hey everyone, my name is Thomas Flynn with Grid Gain, and uh, just a couple items. So thanks for, of course, coming out this evening. Uh, but also we'll be raffling off a drone at the end of the evening. I think a lot of you have already registered for the drawing. Uh, if not, uh, please do so. And also we have um, coupons for the, for the upcoming first ever in-memory computing summit in San Francisco at the end of June, June 29th and 30th. So I have uh, simple small cards that you could take with you if you are members of your team decide to go, there's 30% uh, off the, um, the uh, registration fees. So, and I'll go ahead and pass it over to Nikita. Yeah? Okay, great. All right. Thank you. Can you guys hear me? On the back? I'm pretty, pretty loud usually, so that should work. So, uh, thanks a lot for coming in. I know LA is a bitch traffic-wise. Um, every time I'm here, it takes me hours to get anywhere. Uh, my name is Nikita Ivanov. Um, I'm originally founder of the Grid Game Project. Surprisingly, you know, um, I think this year we celebrated the 10th anniversary, anniversary of it. Uh, the first line of code was written in 2005 uh, by me and my co-founder, Dimitri. So it's a pretty uh, old project, a pretty mature project. And the history of the project, you know, it started as a great game project. It was an open source project, you know, quite a few years ago. As I mentioned to you, the first line was written in 2005. Uh, the first production usage was in 2007. And in 2010, we formed a company around it. And, you know, last year, we moved to the Apache Software Foundation. So that's essentially how Apache Ignite got, you know, got its name. Uh, but the project is not new. It's really very mature. It's one of the most mature projects in the Apache Software Foundation. It's obviously Apache project in itself, Apache server. Um, the software actually is more mature than most of the Hadoop components because of the age and, you know, how it was a battle tested. So what I want to basically talk to you about is Apache Ignite. Um, what is it? What is it not? Uh, we'll talk about some of the in-memory computing things, why we all of a sudden in the last couple of years spend so much time talking about in-memory computing, what it is, um, and we'll talk briefly, I mean, I'm not going to have enough time, I don't want to, you know, really torture you guys this evening, but we're going to talk briefly about some of the key components of in-memory data fabric. Um, in the end of it, I'll give you some of the use cases where it is actually used, uh, quite a few interesting use cases. And by the way, uh, let's make it a you know, kind of dialogue. If you guys have a question, don't wait till the end. Although we have a Q&A session, it's typically going to be all fried by the end of it. So ask questions as we go. <coughs> we don't have to wait. Especially if you see something that's, you know, kind of familiar to you, you want to basically deep drive, you know, or dive deep on it, ask me questions. In-memory computing. 
I've been doing this for literally for over 10 years, and it's amazing how the idea behind memory computing, the drivers, the projects, the economics, the, almost everything has changed in the last decade. So in memory computing, it's a very simple thing, right? We move data into the realm of computers, and we all intuitively understand things will go faster, right? That's the, that's the basic idea. There's nothing more complex than that. You move stuff into the RAM, RAM is pretty quick, and things go faster. Now, the, if you would ask me what was in memory computer 10 years ago, it was completely different. I think what really changed in the last, you know, five to seven years, two major things happened in the memory computing. The first one is on the left side, data growth. You guys all know about this. I'm not going to spend time discussing this. Data is growing exponentially. We all have to have, you know, terabytes of data processed in real time. What really changed in the last, last couple of years is that beyond this, the data growth, we start talking about a data speed and fast data came around. It will we're not, all of a sudden we're talking about how fast we can process data. Not only, not only how can we store this data, storing is kind of solved through, through Hadoop. How, how, how quickly we can process this data and memory can put in place a key role there. But probably the most important one is the chart on the right. You guys barely see it, but you know, you can see the drop over there. It's a cost. Now remember, what was the cost of gigabytes and terabytes RAM 10 years ago? It was enormous. It was basically unattainable for anybody except for the big Wall Street firms and, and three-letter agencies in the government. And that's exactly the reason why in memory computing didn't really uh, took off, uh, although technology was there available for the last maybe 25, 30 years. The combination of the price reduction, and actually today, the price of RAM drops 30% every year and a half. Now think about this, 30% every year and a half. It has exactly the same trajectory as the price of hard disks, spinning hard disks. Spinning hard drives today are essentially free. They don't cost anything, right? You get them for free, quite literally, with computers. Uh, the price of RAM is going in the same direction. Let me give you, let me ask you a question. Uh, imagine you need to buy a, a cluster of, let's say, 10 blades with total capacity of terabyte RAM. One terabyte RAM. How much is going to cost today? Typical DDR3 RAM, nothing fancy. Quarter million, more or less. 50,000, half a million. Yeah. See, and that's pretty cool. That's, look at this you know, discrepancy, right? We're all smart guys here. We're all in this business, right? And we all pretty much off. Today, 10 blades typical Dell blades with a terabyte RAM total cost about $25,000, including everything. Now think about this. For the price of the simple new car or, you know, one and a half salary in Silicon Valley for an engineer, you can buy a terabyte RAM. Just to give you perspective, about a couple of years ago, the entire working set of Twitter, which is about a week of tweets, was about seven terabytes. You get the picture. Uh, so the RAM is becoming very much available, economically feasible. Uh, what was really different, you know, 10 years ago is that that was not completely, it was not a picture at all. You know, RAM was very, you know, um, very expensive just as the, as the RAM itself. You know, remember this, we had a 32-bit CPUs, we had 16-bit CPUs before that. What was the problem with that? You could not address a lot in, this, in, a, in a single computer, so you have to string together multiple computers and not all this rigmarole. Today, essentially, you're right, we can actually have a, a, a server with about terabyte of RAM, um, but it's probably expensive. You can basically have a typical server today with about a quarter terabyte, and it's perfectly fine. You can buy them off the shelf, and they're going to work perfectly fine. What's really also happening new, and I'll, I'll skip it, I'll basically stick on the slide for a while. What's also happening, which may not be, you guys may not be aware of, is the rapid adoption on non-volatile RAM. How many of you guys heard about NVDIMs? So that's pretty cool. None of you heard, but you can only buy it today. NVDIMs are already shipping today in a small quantity, just in small, small capacities. So what's the NVDIM? NVDIM is a non-volatile RAM. Think about this. It's a very ingenious device. Essentially, it's a normal DDR4 stick with a capacitor on it and a small flash right on the same stick. So when the power goes down, it has enough capacity to take the old RAM you know, data 
and cop it into the flash. When system boots up, it will copy the stuff from flash to the RAM. So what you, you get as a developer, and us get as a developer, is that RAM is non-volatile. I store my stuff in RAM, I completely unplug my computer, I plug it back, my RAM is still there. That will completely revolutionize how do we think about a memory company. Because today, in the here of my presentation, most of the time we spend in all this failover, in all this, you know, you know, ability to somehow replicate data so that we don't lose data when the, when the power goes down because RAM today is volatile, right? You unplug the power, content is gone. With a non-volatile RAM, you have absolutely zero penalty on the performance because it's the same DDR4. The only penalty you have is a little bit slower start, which is perfectly fine, but your RAM becomes non-volatile. Today you can buy uh, NVDMs in, I think, 16 gigabyte sizes. By end of the year, we're working with the Dell, working with Micron. By end of the year, you're going to be able to buy 32 and I think 64 gigabyte NVDMs already. And by end of the year, most of the firmware on the motherboards will support that. So essentially, you and I talk next year, we're going to buy laptops that will be supporting NVDMs already. All the major file systems, I'm sorry, operating systems will be supported, yes? Yes, that's what I'm saying, that the firmware will be supported by all the major operating system vendors. But even today, you basically get a C library, and you can use it. Even today. There's, a, there's some applications today that are already using NVDIMS for caching and whatnot. But again, that's why in-memory is here. Another interesting aspect, and um, just look at what my next slide. Another interesting, you know, the last thought on this slide. Think about this. It's a kind of very provocative thought, but in-memory computing, and storing data in RAM is literally a last frontier in the, in, the, in the data storage. Now think about this. We transitioned from tapes in late 50s, right, to disks in late 60s, early 70s. Then we developed the flash. We developed the, the whole new app of disk, disk technologies, right, and SCSI and whatnot. But then we eventually moved to flash, which is a non-moving thing. It got faster. And then we move into memory, right, which is the next layer. And memory is anywhere between, it, typically RAM chips by themselves about a million times faster than a spinning disk. Now, once we move to RAM, think about this, what's next? Where next can we go to store our data in our computer systems without completely rethinking how do we build our computers? Yeah, but CPU cache is about three times faster only and it's very small. It's, it's impractical to do it big. So if you think about this, in memory computing is a really last leg in our evolution and how do we store data and where do we store data. There is nowhere else to store it unless we dramatically change our computers and how they design from the ground up. It's a very pragmatic thought. That's why basically from a business perspective, Flash was always a, a stepping stone. It was never a, a sustainable business. It was basically a temporary solution that we developed. The RAM, especially non-volatile RAM, will be the uh, data storage medium. Uh, we're working with the Dell, and Dell basically th thinks that in a, in a three to five year horizon, most of the data centers that they ship to the government will be fully in memory. Disk will only be used for backup purposes. This is the only reason to use disk. I'm talking about flash disk, obviously. Flash and spinning disks. All the data centers they plan to build will be full in memory data centers with terabytes, hundreds of terabytes RAM in a typical small data center, <clears throat> and disk only used, only, only by, almost by a hardware decision, used as a backup device. So think about this. It's a very interesting kind of, you know, evolution in the last decade, how we went from simple caching use cases, right? How do we cache our database access? How do we cache our, you know, web sessions and whatnot? Literally in the span of a decade, we moved almost all the way into the RAM and we now have small companies like us and bigger companies all moving in the same direction. So, well, let me talk about it in memory data fabric. What is this? <clears throat> so, how many of you guys, let me just get some polling. How many of you guys know what in memory data grids are? Or how many of you guys use data grids? One. All right. All right. So, in memory databases. VolDB, MemSQL, you know, Oracle options, Timestamp. Anybody use those? All right, excellent. So 
In memory data fabric is a, a Java-based distributed middleware software that slides right in between your data sources, whatever they are, SQL, NoSQL, or maybe Hadoop, and your applications. And it gives you all the benefits of in-memory computing, essentially performance, scalability, low latency. Now, when I say it slides in between, it's a very important point. Let me kind of com com uh, give you a comparison. When you deploy an in-memory database, and again, I'm, I'm going to mention to you like MemSQL, VolDB, Timestamp, it's a memory database. You have to replace your existing database with the new database. How many of you guys <clears throat> can go back to your organization and say, hey, let's replace database? That's a big deal. Typically, replacing database is a huge deal from a business perspective. It's very hard to do organizationally. In memory data fabric, <clears throat> apologize for my voice and, you know, too much wine, but in memory data fabric really slides in between. If you have your database, keep it. If you have your Oracle, MySQL, Microsoft SQL, DB2, whatever you have, keep it. If you have your Hadoop installation, keep it. We're going to slide right on top of that in between your applications. And by the way, we support, naturally, we support Java-based clients, any JVM-based languages like Groovy, Java, and Scala, my favorite. We also have clients for <clears throat> .NET and C++ as well. So it slides in between your data sources and your applications. It intelligently will load and up data from whatever data sources you have into the fabric and let your applications process this data right in this in this fabric itself. So the fabric is just a cluster of computers. If you look from a kind of deployment standpoint, it's a fancy name for a bunch of computers. You know, we actually have, I think, a record in terms of the cluster size. <clears throat> uh, one of our clients in London, uh, largest client for us, runs us on 2,000 nodes in a fully transactional topology. Now, think about this. What other software do you know that runs on 2,000 nodes? Very few. <clears throat> we have that as well. So the rest of the presentation, we're basically going to go and talk about all these different features that we have in a data fabric. Now, you might be confused a little bit why <clears throat> we're talking about data fabric. And the fabric is really is, is a nice name because we have different types of payloads that we support on that, on that cluster, different types of use cases. We support data grids, compute grids, service grids, in-memory streaming. We have very advanced clustering. We have a memory file system. Uh, we have in-memory messaging, events, data structures. We have all these different types of use cases that you can do when you have a memory cluster. And that's the biggest difference between us and practically everybody, everybody else, whether it's a project or a product for a company. We take a much more strategic view on in-memory computing. We're basically saying, look, here's your RAM, fully clustered across multiple computers. This is it. Now you can do all kind of processing on it. Not only you can store data in it and use SQL to query it, for example, you can also do streaming processing on it, or you can look at the same data as a file system, or you can look at the same data as a map producer and MPP type of processing. You can do stateless computation like Monte Carlo simulation. You can do streaming on it, and streaming is different, right? It has the continuous querying capabilities. So we treat memory in kind of a strategic way. We're giving, this capability, we're giving you this ability to establish a cluster of RAM, essentially, and do all these different types of processes, or processing, if you will, on that cluster. <clears throat> Again, I apologize for my words. Now, let's talk about um, some of the specifics. Clustering and deployment. Funny enough, I mean, I've been asking, you know, I've been presenting this for years, I've been asked many, many times, what does in-memory have to do with the clustering? Why are we constantly talking about something clustered when we're talking about in-memory? Two things are different, right? One thing is connecting computers together. Another thing is to put stuff in RAM. It's actually a very interesting story. Uh, I've been doing this stuff since, I mean, on and off since literally late 90s. But if you look back in the history, in-memory computing is nothing new. We, if you think about it, every database using memory computing, it is for caching, right? Every database uses caching for cache you know, pieces of data that, you know, frequently get, ask, get access from disk, so we don't spend time accessing disk. What was the problem years ago in terms of the in-memory computing? You could not put enough RAM on a single computer. You got 16-bit CPUs. You can only address, like, what? I don't know, like, 4 gigabyte of RAM, something like this. You, cannot, you can never get enough RAM in a single computer. So in-memory computing systems <clears throat> were the first one that were forced 
to do complex clustering. That's why today, in memory computing systems, ours or anybody else probably will be, must, one, of, will be one of the most advanced clustering solutions on the market. Again, not because we're smarter than anybody else, but because we were forced decades ago to do it. There was no other way. Um, I know a couple of projects in the early 90s that were connecting hundreds of computers together. Believe me, in the early 90s, that was huge when you connect hundreds of computers together. And there was a reason to that, for that because you could never get enough RAM into it. And if you want to have a RAM cluster, back then that was the only way. So historically, uh, in-memory computing systems have very advanced clustering capabilities. It just, there's no other way. Like in-memory databases could be a single server. It's perfectly fine. You can buy your, you know, half a terabyte box, run your, run your database on it. There's nothing, no problem with it. Uh, <clears throat> In memory computer system historically came from a different background is when you connect a bunch of computers together and use the RAM. So the Ignite has very, in my opinion, advanced discovery, clustering, and deployment capabilities. We support both, thank you, we <laughs> support both private and public clouds. We support natively AWS. Uh, if you want to run anything on AWS, you can do that as well. Uh, we support <clears throat> local deployments as well. So you can essentially run a very interesting uh, cluster where a bunch of nodes run on this laptop, a bunch of nodes run on your private data center somewhere in this office, and a bunch of nodes run on Amazon EC2. So as long as you can basically uh, <clears throat> sustain the, the latency differences, which we can technically, but as long as business is, is okay with this, uh, you can run this cluster very effectively. <clears throat> yes? You can name it this year. Yeah, there's probably there's so many different names for it over the over the years. You know, <clears throat> we've been calling ourselves in memory HPC, high performance computing. Uh, shared memory is another one. The difference between <clears throat> shared memory is when we talk about sharing memory, it's predominantly about storing data in RAM. What we also do, we do a very effective computations on this stuff. So. For example, we are about the only framework that can do very effective Monte Carlo simulation. You can literally parallelize your processing on a cluster as well. And I'll talk about this. But that's a good question. So we support, <clears throat> we support zero deployment, which, again, it's kind of hard to talk about. It's a lot easier to see. But fundamentally, what's the biggest problem with you as a developer when you develop an application in a distributed fashion? It's deployment. I, we really, anybody who actually worked in Globus, Globus Toolkit? All right. All right, so in a, in a, <clears throat> in a late 90s, um, I can tell you a personal story. When you walk at the Global Toolkit, one of the first a grid computing projects out of the um, University of Illinois. So the way you work with this is very simple. It was, it, remember back then, it was all the rage about Visdal and SOAP and all this XML-based driven protocols and everything else. So you change the code, <clears throat> and then you click the make script. It takes about 40 minutes to update everything. I vividly remember, I click the button, see it's going, go to lunch. That's how deployment took. Because what's happening is it rebuilds the entire system. It publishes through FTP to all the nodes. It start, stops the node, restarts them again, publishes again. It literally, back then, was taking half an hour, if not longer, to redeploy the system. That's why typically <clears throat> early grid computing systems were so clunky, so hard to use, and so... <laughs> expensive to build. But uh, with the zero deployment, I don't know why it's happening. With the zero deployment, it's pretty cool stuff. We're actually taking all this away from you, and you develop just locally. Imagine this. You basically write in your code, and <clears throat> by the way, you can download examples just to look at much, much easier than examples. You can develop your code locally, click Run, and it will automatically deploy itself to all necessary cluster nodes, no matter where they are. I can deploy from here to the middle of Siberia, with nothing. It works everywhere. It works any IDE, any editor, anything else. It works just in the cluster. It's a very cool technology. Essentially what's happening is that the, the remote node <clears throat> senses that they, you want to execute some piece of code and says, look, I don't have any information about this code. Can I load it up? And it loads up this code from the original node to remote node. It happens throughout the cluster. And Apache Ignite keeps all the proper versioning of that code in terms of Java byte code does all the proper class loading structures in each, node, in each node. It does a lot of stuff. The bottom line for user developers, an absolute joy of development. 
You can basically code away your stuff and it works in hundreds of nodes simultaneously without any single step of deployment. It just automatically works. And we support all the versioning of that. It saves huge, <clears throat> huge amount of time during the development, which is typically where you spend most of the time when you're dealing with systems like this. In memory, <coughs> in memory compute grid, I'm losing my voice. In memory compute grid, now this is where we get into some juicy parts. What is in memory compute grid? In memory compute grid is all about parallelized execution. Think about this. If I have a task and I have a five nodes in front of me, I can split my task into five subtasks, execute those tasks in parallel, get result back, and aggregate them. And if my process is, 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 is ideal, I get this task executed five times faster. This is the basic principle of a parallel program, programming and parallel processing. That's all there is to it, right? But then there's a huge amount of details on how do we fail over, how do we load balance, what's the API, how do we do this, how do we do that? And that's exactly what the memory compute, in memory compute grid does. So first of all, we have a direct API, direct API for two MapReduce implementations. One is the Hadoop MapReduce implementation that's compatible with MapReduce from Hadoop. It works through Yarn. And we also have <clears throat> an optimized for in-memory in memory, uh, MapReduce implementations as well. Zero deployment, I mentioned to you, you can cross-schedule your tasks. So you can execute tasks from a code, if you like, or you can schedule them through a Chrome-like interface. So you can basically have a scheduling tasks. The really cool <clears throat> feature that we have is state checkpoints. Think about this. This actually feature came from our biotech lines, uh, clients. I don't know what the bioscience people do, but almost everything they do takes like days, literally. They, everything they run takes like, you know, day or two. And they came back to us a years ago and said, guys, it's so nice and dandy, but if our algorithm breaks like in the hour of five, we have to start from scratch from, our, from number one. And we developed a simple feature basically that you can checkpoint your task like every 30 seconds and store that intermediate state somewhere, like in our data grid, I'll describe to you. And if your task fails, <clears throat> you can restart that task from that checkpoint. Very simple feature. We have a very uh, nice way of doing this. If you have a long running task, this is the, this is the huge time saver uh, because you don't have to restart from scratch. <clears throat> so how much of data can as much as you have a remnant cluster. Or, or, or the disk bigger. Yeah, if it's too huge, I mean, look, as any in memory systems, if it doesn't fit in RAM, we will overflow on the disk with a huge. In theory, you're right. It may happen. But look, I mean, uh, how often would your intermediate state will be like in quarter terabytes or something like this? It's like a, something is wrong with the algorithm, probably. So typically, it's pretty small. I mean, we have clients who basically do this long-term things like, you know, MPEG encoding or, you know, searching within MPEG, which can take like minutes, right? Which is not hours, but still, they use checkpoints because when they, it's actually surprisingly, the checkpoints used not through production, but during the development. When you're debugging your algorithms, right? If it takes like five minutes to run the algo, algo and it breaks in the fourth minute, you have to start from scratch. Or you can start from a checkpoint and really complete it pretty quickly once you fix it. So surprisingly for us, you know, uh, most of the folks that use checkpoints use it for development, during the development. In production, you know, things should, should not be breaking at all. And <laughs> that's not the case for production usage. But for developers, it's an awesome feature. Yes? <coughs> I know them pretty well. Uh, Tachyon is just a file system. So uh, we also have file system. Yeah, we can argue who's better. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's a little bit unfair a check comparison because Tachyon is just a file system and Fabric is, you know, the entire universe of different use cases. As far as I know, Tachyon, and I think it is a file system in RAM. Uh, 
Are you sure we're talking about the same thing? Because I know Takeon pretty well. I know the founder of Takeon. But the difference, again, it's not difference be better or worse. It's just a difference in a very different application of that. So the, the Tachyon is literally a access to the RAM cluster as a file system. You open a file, you write to it, you close file, you read file. That's the API of Tachyon, primary, primary API. Here you have a completely different thing. So you have a compute grids, you have a key value access through a data grid, you have a SQL access to it, you have an MPP, MPI processing, you have a streaming, capability. So it's, it's like a little bit apples and oranges. It's very different. The only commonality, I'll, I'll get back to you, the only commonality is that both in, both in RAM. That's a good question. I would say probably over half the usage of Apache Ignite and Grid Game before that is when people use this as the primary system of records. Not as a cache, but as a primary system of records. There's probably about a half of usage where still people still use that as this enormous caching layer, and the data still lives somewhere else, like file system databases. But about half, and again, I'm, I'm making a kind of big cut there, about a half of our usage comes from people who use Grid Gain, Apache Ignite as a system of records. That's a very interesting way. Let me give you this, kind of, you know, this thought to you. The, I'm looking at a memory computing as memory first, disk second. And traditional computing is disk first, memory second. So in memory computing, doesn't mean you remove the disks. Absolutely no. Every memory computing system would have disks for the backup purposes. And uh, half of why usage comes exactly from that, that people actually <clears throat> use Ignite as a primary system of records and they use existing database as a transactional backup store because there's a basically different reporting system, what not. Look at your databases. So you have like, you know, tens of applications running against those databases. You cannot remove them. But you can move data up in the, in the memory layer and get dramatically different performance characteristics of this, but still keep the data in databases so that the legacy systems can operate properly. Yes? A little bit more, yeah, because the Spark and our design is at least has a computational capabilities to it. It has no data storage, right? Spark is not a data store system. It's a processing system. As far as storage, it uses HDFS or Tachyon or S3 or whatever else. Uh, <clears throat> that's basically where you guys have to try, because my, my take on the Spark, and we actually, I love the project. For me, Spark is predominantly for interactive data science. And interactive is the key word here, is where you can basically log into your either a Spark Cloud or your console and start basically manually typing queries, see results, and work with them. It's very not, it's not designed for the machine-to-machine -machine analytics. Let me give you one example. And again, it, it may sound biased, but it's not. Our SQL processing is about 100 times quicker. You know why? Because we, can, we have indexes in our SQL, and Spark doesn't. We have indexes, not only primary indices, but we have a secondary indices. So you can, we have user-defined indexes in our, in our SQL processing. And Spark doesn't. And not because Spark is not smart people, but Spark is very smart guys. But when you have an RDD design, it's very hard to implement index into the RDDs because RDDs are very autonomous. This is a chunk of data that can be functionally translated, transformed. But you don't really have access to individual elements to it in an effective way. And that's why, for example, SQL on Spark is extremely slow. I mean, ask anybody who tried to use it you know, for any reasons. People dump it because it's, like, it's, it's nice when you manually do something. It takes five seconds. Who cares, right? But if it takes five seconds on your production system, it, it's unusable. So that's why I think Spark really um, shines when you have an interactive use case, when a data scientist really logs in, try to do something you know, in interactive sessions. That's where Spark is the best, especially with a, a Spark Cloud. It's a really, really, really great system. When you're trying to move into the um, kind of machine-to-machine -machine analytics 
or actual computations for your production systems with OTP systems, if you will. Um, Spark was never designed for it. It's just, you know, same misuse as, you know, look at three or four years ago, people using Hadoop in, in OTP systems, trying to figure out how do I introduce my Hadoop payloads may produce into my transactional processing. And then start screaming, oh my God, it takes, you know, 10 minutes to process anything. Yeah, it was never designed for it. It was a misuse. And so is, I believe, a Spark. Spark a use case, killing zone for Spark is the interactive data science. That's where it's the best. <clears throat> No, SQL is SQL. <laughs> There's no complexity in SQL. We actually have other things that are actually not standard like MapReduce, our MapReduce, our streaming, our computational grid. Those, there's no standards there. And there you have to learn APIs. And, um, but again, I guess I, I don't want to come out as, you know, I'm kind of bashing Spark because I love the project. And we actually, you know, we're kind of very friendly with the same ecosystem with Apache. Uh, <clears throat> it's just, you know, when something gets so popular as Spark, which is great. It's one of the most, it's the number one project in Apache, by the way, the fastest growing project. <clears throat> a lot of people starting to misuse it and a lot of, you know, fads creating like, oh my God, it doesn't work here, it doesn't work here. You have to understand where to use it because there's no universal software. I mean, grid gain is not, for example, good or Apache not good for interactive analytics yet. We may work on it in the future, but right now it's not there. And Spark is perfect for interactive approach. <clears throat> Apache Ignite is perfect for your machine to machine analytics where speed and performance really matters. All right. Data grids, <clears throat> that's probably the biggest part of the uh, fabric because just the code-wise and size-wise, it's the most complex part. So data grid is very similar to compute grid, right? Compu what's compute grid again? Compute grid is all about parallelizing your computations. Data grid is all about parallelizing your data storage. If I have a terabytes of data or terabyte and I have a 10 nodes, how do I partition my data? How do I store this terabyte on these 10 nodes? Somehow I have to partition, I have to look for replicas, I have to look for the failover. There's like a whole can of worms problems exist with this whole setup, right? Nodes can die, nodes can, you know, become loaded, unloaded. There's so many different ways that happening or so many different things that can be happening with the data grid and we all have to basically solve that. But fundamentally, in memory, data grid is all about the key object, key value store. It's a, it's a, it is a key value store both key and a value are Java objects. They can be as complex as you need them. That's the fundamental data model. You have a key value access to it, you have a SQL access to it, you have a Lucene text query access to it, you have a H2 access to it. There's a multiple interface to exactly the same data. We also have a file system access to it as well. But fundamentally, it's a Java object key value store. That's it. So, <clears throat> We have both replicated and partitioned caches. And cache essentially, think about a cache as a table in database. It's basically a named block of RAM across the cluster. Now, what's the difference between replicated and partitioned cache? In replicated cache, all data is replicated across all nodes. You might ask, you know, why the hell are you doing this, right? Because your total capacity will be just capacity of one node. You'll be surprised that there are many <clears throat> business payloads that are fairly small in size, but will greatly benefit from a high availability. Because when you do replicated caching, you get the highest availability because your data is on every node. You can basically send your computation to any node on the cluster, and it's going to have a local data right there available for this computation. So it's a great deal, and it's actually the often overlooked capability of a memory of data grids. You have a replicated cache. Uh, not all the data has to be replicated. There's a, definitely, you know, if you finance your, um, your master data could be replicated. It's very small, right? It's just basically your portfolios. Yes? It's a pro cache. Data grid can have uh, as many caches as you like, but the type, the type of the cache, replicate or partition is pro cache. So you can have multiple caches in data grid. Typically, our customers would have, you know, dozens of caches, or like 
every little thing. And each cache can be configured differently. Now, <clears throat> partition cache is different, and that's kind of a primary data storage model. In partition cache, your data is equally partitioned across nodes. So if you have a 10 nodes, each node would have a one-tenth of the entire data set. Now, that's not the end of it, right? If you have, <clears throat> if you have replicas, which is essentially the ability to copy the data from to multiple nodes, just make sure that you have a failover. In case one node dies, you have the same data in multiple nodes. Then you have replicas, and your total capacity of a cluster will go down a little bit, obviously. As many replicas you have, you're going to have proportionally less space. I don't know why is it doing this, but... Uh, All right, so I get asked this question every time. Uh, what's the total, what's the maximum size of the data grids? Again, I don't know what the maximum size. I would say typical size for us and probably for our you know, friends and competitors will be lower teens of terabytes. In memory computing systems are not the systems of terabytes. We're not there yet. And typically, if you have a gigabytes, you can keep it in your iPhone. You don't need any systems. So typical, you know, kind of, you know, threshold is when you get in terabytes, that's where it starts making sense because we can really provide you a, a sub-millisecond processing on terabytes of data. Think about this. Sub-milliseconds on terabytes of data. And I, I'll, I'll show you the example of where we achieved that. So back to our memory data grid. One of the biggest advantages we have across any other systems is we support full asset transactions on this data exactly the same transactions you'll find in databases. We support both optimistic and pessimistic transactions, and we support all isolation levels, read committed, read uncommitted, repeatable reads, and serializable reads, even serializable reads, by the way. You can build exactly the same financial systems with this as you could with any database like Oracle. You can move money, you can transact accounts, you can do whatever you like. It's exactly the same guarantees. <clears throat> Not only does in memory, if you have a database connected to it, it will propagate these transactions back to database and will make sure that the entire transaction spans both RAM and database and commits or rollbacks as one. It's pretty advanced stuff. Now, it's very different approach from a typical a eventual consistency approach. You guys know what eventual consistency, right? And that's, you know, we were, we were kind of kicked around a couple of years ago, about five, seven years ago, because we actually decided not to go with eventual consistency with a kind of cap theory and approach. <clears throat> and I think in a late, lately we've been kind of vindicated. What's the problem with the cap implementations? You can never get to a full transactional behavior. Even with a full quorum, you can never get to this normal two-phase commit quality of transactions. You always have this, you know, extra steps you have to resolve yourself. So the cap is good, eventual consistency is good when you don't ever need the normal traditional transactions. With this system, we took a different approach. We developed the two-phase commit protocol implementation from scratch. It took us years to mature that. But then we added to it. So what's the first, of all, first of all, what's the problem with two-phase commit? It's slow. It's basically slow. It's a great protocol. It guarantees consistency, but it's slow. Uh, it's slower than eventual consistency. But what we've done is this. We then introduced optimizations in the two-phase commit protocol so that you as a developer, when you think you don't need to have full consistency, you can relax the protocol and gain back all the performance. For example, we support asynchronous commits. The biggest problem with two-phase commit protocol, the most of the payload is in the, in the commit state, commit messages that has to be synchronous. You have to wait for acknowledgement. If you don't wait for acknowledgement, your performance jumps false because, you become, you, because data becomes inconsistent potentially, but in very rare cases because you already prepared everything, right? You only send commits. But you, if you don't wait for commits to turn back, essential acknowledgement, you can get a lot of back performance. And then we have multiple optimizations like this. So again, we took a different approach. We start with a full transactional implementation, exactly the same you can find in any database. And then we introduce multiple optimizations. How do you relax consistency to gain speed? And I think that's a much better approach <clears throat> because with this system, you don't have to basically reinvent the wheel trying to get the transactions to go. Like, you know, look at MongoDB debacles, look at everything else. You can never get normal transactional behavior in those, in those systems. In our system, you can. And that's the default mode. And if you don't need transactions, put those Boolean flags to true or false 
and you can relax consistency and get performance back. Yes. If you have database, yes. If you don't have database, obviously we're faster. Right. And then next one is, um, we do have to have two things with database in it. Then what would be the advantage of using the, uh, yeah, because it's kind of like, I mean, the, um, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yes, if your system is predominantly write only, no advantages. So if you have a database and you have a full transaction you know, right through into database, you have to have a read mostly system to gain any advantages. Because if you're constantly writing, you, there's absolutely no point. You're actually going to be making the system slower because you're going to be committing in memory, in distributed fashion, and then in database for no reason. Because you'll be constantly overwriting and overwriting again and again and again. So yes, in this case, like by the way, in many cases, in memory systems are good, especially when you have a write through and read through behavior a good when you have a read mostly profile in, in your payloads. If you have write mostly profiles and you have a database that you're going to read through and write through, you're not going to get much. All right, let's move on. Service grid. It's an interesting feature. You know, we've been asked this for years and years, and people are saying, look, guys, we already have a cluster with grid gain Apache Ignite. And we need to run like in you know, one service on, right? With simple SLA, only once, at most once. If the server, you know, if the node goes down, can you guys restart that service on a different node so that we have like, you know, a, a, a service that automatically has its own kind of health monitoring and restarts itself when the node goes down. And many of our clients were implementing themselves, it's not a big deal, but we actually did this ourselves and now we have a absolutely brilliant service grid. You can define any kind of service on this grid supply the SLA, which is essentially how it works on a cluster, on a SAP cluster, on a node singleton, and we're going to maintain that SLA. We're going to basically monitor the service. If the node goes down or it gets restarted, we're going to start the service somewhere else. We'll keep only one or two or three instances, as many as specify. Very nice thing. Surprisingly for us, it's kind of an auxiliary feature, but it's used literally almost in every project. Because funny enough, when you have, you know, dozens of nodes, you start finding use cases for this. There's got to be running some service somewhere here or there for some functionality in your business. And we're finding that in a very, uh, very nice feature. Streaming, I want to step, I want to kind of stick to this for a couple of minutes we have. This is something new, basically, that we've been working on for a couple of years. And, and I think we just released a latest version of this. And the streaming is a pretty cool use case, right? What's the difference between typical um, data payloads and streaming, right? Or typical database. Typical databases or finite, finite um, data sets, right? They have a beginning and end, right? Look at your database. You can look at the table. This is the beginning, this is the end, right? Streaming has no end, has no beginning. It's constantly in transition. Um, and that poses a lot of problems. You cannot really use SQL on, right? You cannot really query something that's completely in flex. You know, you cannot query a table that is basically has no beginning, no end. There's no indices on it. So typically what people you know, end up doing is they develop the approach of a sliding window. So you constantly operate on a sliding window within a stream, right? And a sliding window is definitely defined by you as a developer. Last 10 events, last 10 minutes, last whatever. You define that sliding window. And then you have <clears throat> what's called a continuous query on a sliding window. Now a sliding window, now a sliding window has a, a, a finite properties, right? It's right there. And you can run a SQL query on it. But instead of having just a one result, you're now getting basically a callback with a continuous updates of results. As window slides through a stream, you get basically a response back. This is a very nice, very simple, I would say brilliant API to use that. We're not alone there, by the way. There's a couple other projects doing this. Uh, <clears throat> what's really cool for us, it's fully integrated with our in-memory data grid. So you can stream data from all the different types of streamers, from file, from Twitter, for few that's closed. But Facebook, whatever else, and you can put this in data grid as a sliding window <clears throat> very effectively, run SQL query, run you know, any type of predicate-based query, get results back as a callback, has very simple API, very simple to use, and <clears throat> the beauty of that is it scales just as in the entire data grid scales. 
So it's all in memory, it's all distributed, very nice design. Uh, <clears throat> I don't have too much time, guys, but you can look at examples. It's very cool examples we have. Hadoop accelerator. You know, now you're getting a sense about why we call this fabric, right? We have so, this, all these different use cases for what you can do in RAM, right? Remember, we can do compute grade. We can do basic clustering. If you just want to cluster computers together and use them as a one big pile of RAM processing computers, we can do that. We can do data grade. We can do streaming. Right? We can do file systems. That's why we call it a fabric, not just the one particular data grade computer, but the fabric of things. One of the things in a fabric is Hadoop Accelerator. Now, I'll be very quick about what we've done here. Pretty cool stuff, by the way. And that's, by the way, will be another difference between Spark and us. We took a little bit different approach. So about three years ago, people started talking to us. Uh, awesome project, you know, but we already have a Hadoop. We're not going to rewrite anything. Can you guys just speed up Hadoop? We looked at it, and if anybody you know Hadoop, there are two, th two things in Hadoop. One is the GFS, which is storage. Right? Another is MapReduce, which is the processing engine. So if you speed up the, if you speed up them, two of them, you're going to speed up Hadoop. So we started with HDFS, and we developed our own in-memory file system that's fully compatible with HDFS. It can work in two modes. It can work as a standalone file system, fully replacing HDFS. And by the way, in this mode, you can remove any name nodes for your deployment because we take care of all the, all the management of the metadata. It can also work as, <clears throat> as a caching layer on top of the secondary HDFS. So it can work in two modes. So when we've done that, uh, it didn't really help much. To our surprise, we run all the tests, and yeah, file system in and of itself was very fast and much faster than HDFS. Well, we're in memory. Why not? But the MapReduce jobs were not getting faster at all. And uh, Yes? Yes. And I'll, I'll address Taki on one more time again. But let me finish this one for a while, and I'll come back to you. So then, you know, this is basically the reason why, uh, you guys don't see it, this is the reason why, you know, file system didn't really help. Because if you see all those barely visible gray lines, this is the, exactly the, um, the execution flow of the standard Hadoop. And this thick blue line is the execution floor flow of the Apache Ignite when it works with Hadoop. So what happens with Hadoop, install, Hadoop design, it's very chatty. There's a lot of interaction between multiple subsystems, like you know, the job tracker, the task tracker, the name nodes, and everything else, the data nodes. Um, what we've developed, essentially, once we have our file system developed, we developed a, our own implementation of MapReduce based on Yarn, so it's fully pluggable. But once we've done that, then things really start working pretty nicely. So to make the long story short, again, I'm, I'm very quick, guys, just to a uh, very high level. But to make the long story short, if you download Hadoop, if you run you know, a typical Hadoop example, like Pi calculation, comes with Hadoop, run on a stack, on a, on a stack Apache Hadoop, then deploy the Apache Ignite into it 30 times faster. The beauty is zero code change. And that's the biggest difference between Spark. In Spark, you have to redesign everything from scratch, and then you have to move data into it, which could be pretty cool. I like the scale I, I design very much, but for a lot of, for a lot of folks, that's a big no-no. I don't want to redesign anything. I don't want to change my hype and pick things. I want to basically just use whatever you, I have today, but makes it much faster. That's exactly what our accelerator does. Zero code change, complete plug and play. Uh, our internal tests show anywhere between three to five times, up to a hundred times faster on exactly the same code base. You don't have to even recompile anything. Just run exactly the same task, MapReduce, Python, Java, Hive, Pig, anything you like. It's going to work faster, but they, <clears throat> unfortunately, the range is pretty large. Again, it's anywhere between three to five times to up to a hundred times. And it's very hard to quantify. You literally have to try it to see if it works for you. Yes? Because, for example, if your task spend all its time uh, in the CPU crunching, we cannot help. But if your task spends a lot of time in I/O, then we help dramatically. And it's very hard to look. We cannot we cannot change the way Hadoop works. All this, you know, you know stupid sorting and then all the phases, you know, that most people don't need. Uh, it's we cannot change that. Uh, and sometimes we gain a lot of performance benefits. Sometimes we don't. 
If you really want to get about a thousand times faster, if not longer, if not more, switch to our different MapReduce implementation. But then you have to change the code. You have to rewrite it in our own APIs. Then it's going to be dramatically faster. Yes? Impala? <clears throat> TES is, you know, TES, again, TES is, as far as I know TES, and I, I probably know little about it, TES is predominantly about in-process execution. And we obviously do that as well. There is, look, in, the EDC of, you know, Hadoop, and I say it with a strong way, I think it's pretty much EDC, is that it's, it, it launches the GVM for every goddamn task. So, that basically removes any capability to use it in any real-time scenario whatsoever. And it, it's obviously very lazy engineering because, yeah, we launch the whole GVM, we can crash one process, and basically all the garbage that was in, gone, so it's clean setup, you know, we can do that. But it, it takes seconds to launch the GVM, if not longer. Uh, so TESS was doing, obviously, we're doing it in process too. There is no way without, doing, without in process execution. Uh, Impala, as far as I know, <clears throat> Anybody from Cloudera here? I'm not going to offend anybody, right? <laughs> so I don't know what they have, what, what's the deal with Impala. Impala essentially is a SQL engine on top of Hadoop, right? Um, we don't really play in the same sandbox because we don't really do SQL on top of Hadoop. We do SQL on top of Data Grid, which is much more effective. Um, so I don't really know how to compare. Um, it's just apples and oranges. It's different things. We compare, for example, to Spark somewhat, but again, even that is not a fair comparison because Spark is an interactive thing, we're a machine to machine thing. You know, we design differently with different use cases in mind. All right, guys, I want to give you a quick, I know you're already tired. So, this is basically a quick snapshot of our best in industry, and I say with a straight face, management and monitoring tools. Uh, <clears throat> I spent a lot of time designing, building the stuff with my team back in the day. and. Uh, this is the best DevOps environment for running large clusters. Huge amount of information, good looking, good functional design, gives you a lot of you know, capabilities to monitor your cluster. I know you don't see much here, but you can actually download and try it out. And you know, look, when you're running 20, 30, 100 nodes, you gotta have some UI. <coughs> it's impossible to know what's happening within, uh, within a cluster without a good, good management tools. A few cases about where actually the stuff is used. Again, I'm not going to spare, I'm not going to torture you too much on this kind of business side. But financial services, right? Almost everywhere. Right? We're the first clients for us, first clients for all the memory computing in any imaginable way. You can basically use automatic trading, you know, high frequency trading, fraud protection, fraud detection, uh, any kind of risk analysis, portfolio risk analysis, anything you can imagine today is pretty much runs on the memory. And uh, we have plenty of customers on the Wall Street and all our competitors and friends have customers there. So pretty much the entire Wall Street today runs one way or another on the memory computing. Online mobile advertisement, so we're in this company today. Uh, we have a number of clients who basically run this. If you look at these charts over there, you can see it's all real-time things. So naturally, for these use cases, in-memory is the key. Um, uh, there's, no, there's no faster way to compute things today than in-memory. And people like in advertisement, people, uh, they basically translate that to the money in a very direct way. Online gaming, surprisingly, um, we have a number of clients from, you know, iPhone games and actually Sony PlayStation games. A couple of uh, big titles in Sony PlayStation run us on the back end. Um, again, I was surprised to see, to know, to kind of learn that in today's world, the games actually designed predominantly on the back end, not on the front end. Front end can be done literally in, in a matter of a few months with all the technology that have today, the back end is going to spend most of the time how to basically maintain all the spike in usage and then drop in usage, how to monetize this plateau and everything else. And so they use this um, on the back end of some of the games. Interesting a use case that crosses any kind of, you know, silo industry is a SaaS enablement. And that's, you know, very kind of, you know, new to us. We're starting to see a lot of customers, and I'm talking about paying customers, who basically come to us and say, look, we're moving from a traditional client-server architecture to a SaaS, right? And we, what's happening when you move to SaaS? All of a sudden, you have 10 times more customers on exactly the same hardware because they're shared. So you, got, you have to somehow maintain all this performance and all the metrics and SLAs. And generally, in memory computing, especially fabric that has all these different use cases built into it and types of payloads, not just the one data grid or compute grid 
or streaming, but the entire fabric really helps you to build the SaaS-based applications. And a bunch of clients we have. Let me give you this one last example. Remember I told you they're gonna show you there's some pretty, 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 pretty good numbers. So, <clears throat> pre-boarding use case, we, a couple of years ago, we won a pretty big deal with the largest, one of the largest bank in Europe. And uh, it was kind of portfolio analytics. Essentially, the bank was, did the POC. The POC was pretty interesting. Look at this, it's the largest, it's one of the largest bank in Europe. Can you imagine the book of business they're doing, right? They basically said, what if, what if we're gonna recalculate the risk for every position in our book on each tick from the market. Nobody needs it, believe me. But what if we could, right? And again, to make the long story even shorter, we, we did this, we won the, won the contract and everything else. But listen to the numbers that we achieved. We achieved a one billion, with a B, transactions per second. I'm talking about a fully asset transactions on measly 25K cluster on the tail 10 Dell commodity blades. Now, it's not that much about the grid gain of Apache Ignite, although that's the software that did it. But that's basically what can be done today with a memory campaign. Think about this, a billion transactions per second, fully asset transactions per second on a 25K worth of hardware in a free software, literally. Things are completely unimaginable, you know, literally 10 years ago. Today, you get the most expensive Oracle installation on, on, on Exa data boxes, the biggest one you can trick out. You may get 15, 10 to 15 million transactions per second. That's, that will cost you millions of dollars from Oracle. On a 25K of hardware in a free software, you can get a billion. That's, the, what's, that's what's really exciting about MMA. That's what so many different companies jumping on it. And there's so many examples. Remember what's up? Full in-memory system. Full in-memory system based in Erlang. They were able to basically have a company of 30 people, 30, maintaining the entire, entire ecosystem of this, of, this, of this company. And the reason why, it's all in memory. They could basically process all this stuff in memory properly. Ten servers. Yeah. Yeah. We actually. I can tell you this. I can tell you the personal story. So it's actually a company headquartered in Moscow, out of all places. Oh, they should. I agree. So the funny thing. So this guy is actually when we send them this results, they're like, oh, no, it's impossible. So you guys come to us. So we flew to Moscow, and uh, we show them results again in Moscow. <laughs> and, we are the only company that basically could have a meeting and finish the POC within the meeting. Like you click a button, like five minutes later, you get the result. The, everybody else, and we have like uh, Coherence and Oracle, we have VolDB, we have typical stuff, and they basically took like days. Uh, and then basically they couldn't believe either, so they went through entire coding line by line with us. We spent like a week there, making sure there's no tricks there. And then they basically <laughs> confirmed that, and. Uh, so, yeah, we spent like, you know, a couple of weeks in Moscow having fun. But even for us, it was a little bit surprising. But yeah, like, guys, let's be honest. In this scenario, nothing was hidden disk. It was all in memory. Let's be clear here. The minute you hit anything outside of RAM, your performance drops about 100x. So it's all in RAM. It was perfectly fine. Data set, huh? It was not here, it's like literally, in, I remember Java code, like half a page. It's like, you know, tick comes in, you recalculate some, you know, some basic formulas. It was not a big deal. It was not about computationally intensive at all. It was all about, can you sustain this, this idiotic requirement that every position in my global bank will be recalculated on every tick from the market, on every stock? And again, that was just a made up, made up reason but they want to see if there's a software that can support that. Obviously, they don't need this. But it, gives, it gave them a huge assurance that as they go forward with more complex computation, more complex metrics and modeling, they can use that and actually use that. Uh, but again, this is actually pretty cool stuff. And this has, has a ramification for everything, not only financials. Look at your variable device, right? Like in 10 years, all of us will have some better chips for some health reasons, right? Can you imagine how much data will be generated? 
And those things actually real, real life save us if they're real time. If you have a heart attack or something, and this thing can, you know, report it back, you can save your life. So things like this will have dramatic effect on us going forward. And the back ends will be built on this technology, not Apache Ignite, but in memory computing specifically. The last one, uh, I think uh, we already mentioned that we're going to have a memory summit. By the way, guys, everybody's invited. It's a, it's a really first industry. Uh, it's not, by the way, great game. It's an industry uh, vendors neutral. Uh, <clears throat> we happen to host this. Um, everybody, more than welcome to join us in San Francisco and every other company. Yes? So we support data center application, uh, both active, 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 passive. <clears throat> Naturally, if you want to have a fully transactional replication, your performance is going to be dismal. Because for every update in one data center, you're going to update it over the internet on a different data center. So the, every update will take a second. So we support multiple optimizations there. Uh, we support buffering, asynchronous updates, and whatnot. We can talk about this in offline. But fundamentally, essentially, what should you have? You have active, active, or active, passive. So both of them can be active with a little bit of a difference in data, naturally, or can be active, passive, where only one is active and this used as basically as just a synchronous copy of that. That's a... I, I wouldn't remember details right now. I have to look at it. But it's, it's a very custom thing. You have to program it. I mean, we, you have to configure it. Let me put it this way, very specifically. There, there, is like, there is no standard APIs for this for what's, what's, whatsoever. It's a very specific thing. We actually developed for a client customer. Uh, we actually developed it quite recently, about a year ago, for a customer who needed this. And we used that customer as a kind of guinea pig to really test and test and test and test and test. Uh, and right now, it's in, it's in pretty good shape, but it took a while. The biggest thing about that data center application, you know what? How the hell do you test this? Think about it. <laughs> Everybody has completely different environments, you know, completely different latencies, network, computers, geographies, everything. So, yes, we can test between, you know, Foster City and St. Petersburg in Russia, but that's a completely different scenario than anybody like, you know, Tokyo and London and New York. So it's... Um, it took us a while. What's in a good shape right now? Any other questions, guys? Yes? Yeah. We don't have a specific support. I mean, like, we don't have an integration just like Spark has uh, for MLLib. But it will take with just a little bit, little bit more extra steps to do it with, the grid game, with Apache Net than, than Spark. Spark has a little bit better integration. But nothing prevents it, just a library. You can basically, uh, you will have to, let me put this way to you. Let me kind of roll it back. I do not know, it may take a lot more legwork than Spark. Um, so, yeah, I will deal with this. It, Spark has a better integration right now with, this, with MLLib, just directly, direct integration. They implemented it with the Spark, all this parallelization. Uh, with Apache Ignite, you probably have to re-implement some of the logic with the MLLib natively in Apache Ignite. Again, as far as, as much as how much work is it, I do not know. I cannot tell you much. It may be just a one evening. It could be a week of work. I do not know. But it's, by the way, this is one area we're going to be working on. One thing's in the roadmap for Apache Ignite. We're going to be <clears throat> we work on integration with Apache Zeppelin, which is exactly the technology that's behind uh, Spark Cloud all this, you know, UI notebooks style. Uh, we're going to have that integrated as well. So we're moving very actively into the interactive side as well. And by the way, Spark is moving into the machine-to-machine -machine stuff as well. So the two projects kind of, you know, uh, converging on the kind of, you know, ideas, which is good, good for all of us. Any other questions? Uh, we do not have integration with Mahout, no. For Mahout, Spark. Spark is much better for Mahout. Yes. So, 
you guys uh, going to do that sort of traditional like, vendor? Yeah, as far as great gain company is concerned, you know, we're in exactly the same model like Hadoop Cloudera, yeah. Apache Ignite, great gain. Absolute identical thing. So great gain provides your enterprise version of that with you know, more features, you know, more stability, support, training, uh, professional service around it. So it's a very typical model. And we actually, we were, surprisingly enough, it took us quite a while. We were always open, open. We were always open source. And we like started with LGPL license and then moved to Apache lately and then actually moved to the Apache last year. Uh, but we've always been open source project. We started as an open source project. Just we, in, in the last couple of years, I mean, not the last couple, but in uh, 2010, 11, 12, and 13, I guess, we were concentrating on the more kind of enterprise staff level features because it takes a lot of time to develop it. I mean, I, I mentioned to you guys, you know, data center application. Why do you think nobody has it? It's a bitch to develop. It, it takes years to develop. Quite literally, years. It takes you a year to develop and another year or two to test it properly across multiple clients. It's a, it's a, it takes time. It's, it's just, there's no way to make it faster. And there's quite a few features like this, like SQL stuff. Even though we use H2 in the back end, it's still pretty complex stuff. For example, we support a custom functions in SQL. You can write functions in Java and use them in SQL. Pretty cool stuff. It's actually very advanced stuff because you can augment your SQL beyond whatever SQL supports. You can write your own function and use it right in a select statement, for example. So we have many, many like, pieces and bits of technologies like this across the enterprise product and across an you know, open source project uh, that, that took years. You know, for example, we support a full portable object. You can store object from C++ and retrieve it from Java. And we're going to convert all the types properly for you. So you can have C++ clients working with Java clients, working with .NET, .NET clients, with absolute transparency. We're going to take care of everything. So a lot of these features took quite some time to develop. But you know, a lot of them, most of them right now in Apache Ignite, uh, there is still an enterprise version that has some of the key features like management capabilities, security. Uh, we have a great security, by the way, um, that was designed for us and spec'd out by the largest bank in the world. Uh, I'm not going to mention the name, uh, but believe me, if it works for them, it would work for everybody. Uh, so Enterprise Version has some of the key features as well. Thank you, guys. All right, you guys want to raffle? Who gets the drone? Huh? Are we doing the drone now? I think we're going to get to the raffle now, yeah, so okay. uh, stick around. I want to thank everybody for coming out. Thank you very much, Nikita, for that phenomenal talk, uh, despite the technical glitches. And uh, just one more reminder that uh, Big Data Day LA is on June 27th. Um, so keep, uh, keep an eye out for the notification, uh, for a notification email coming out from me soon. Thanks.